Hello everybody and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Bradley Horton. I'm one of the engineers here at the MathWorks. Now if you've given up your time today with the expectation that you'll be seeing how a quadcopter can be modelled within the MATLAB environment and more importantly how that MATLAB environment can be used to encourage those deeper learning engagements with your students, if they're your expectations today then I want to let you know you are at the right place. That's exactly what we'll be covering in today's session. Before we, be, we begin that, let me walk you through just two logistical items. If you have any problems hearing the audio or seeing the video in today's presentation, please contact the webinar host and you can do that by typing into the chat panel that should be embedded in your web browser. Similarly, if you have any questions for me during the course of the presentation, please type those questions into the Q&A panel embedded in your browser and we'll be trying to answer as many of those questions as we can at the end of today's session. Before I bring up an agenda just to define you know that the roadmap for the topics that we're going to cover, why don't we start at the very end? Let me show you the quadcopter model that we're going to be pulling apart today. Okay, so this is actually the mathematical model of the quadcopter and it's built in MATLAB and Simulink. Let me introduce you to a couple of the systems inside this model. If I start on the very left hand side of the model, we have a, a mechanism for defining the XYZ coordinates, the trajectory uh, that we want our vehicle to fly. And we take these XYZ uh, trajectory coordinates and we push them into one of the control system layers uh, within the model. In this particular control system, uh, we have four individual controllers, uh, one for altitude, one for pitch and roll, and one for yaw. And they all have identical um, uh, structures. And that structure is this classic cascade uh, dual loop uh, design. There's an inner velocity loop and there's an outer positional loop. So at this level uh, of, of the control design, we take the XYZ coordinates and we generate commanded thrust and torque values that we need to apply to the vehicle in order to, to make it move the way we want it to. So what do we do with these commanded thrusts and torques? Well, we take them and we push them into the next level uh, of, of our control system. Let me take you into that second level now. So in that second level, we take the commanded thrusts and torques and we produce the corresponding motor speeds um, that make those thrusts and torques. And there's actually a quadratic relationship between motor speed and the amount of thrust that is produced at that speed, and also the amount of torque that's produced at that speed. This is actually going to be one of our learning tasks, uh, and that is looking at how you can take empirical data that you may have co collected in a lab, and how you can deduce or, or uh, calculate what those coefficients relating speed to generated thrust and torque is. Now for any model like this, you would just naturally assume that there should be uh, some implementation of Newton's classic um, a second law, and you're absolutely right. So let me show you what those Newton equations of motion uh, look like uh, in, in this model. And here they are. So what's really nice about this sort of visual environment for defining dynamic systems is you get to see the coupling and the interaction between the various components in the model. So a concrete example of that is if I sort of focus on, say, the moment component of Newton's second law, you can see that we sort of take um, uh, vehicle accelerations and we integrate them and we get, end up with uh, vehicle angular body rates, omega, or W in this view, and we take those angular body rates and we convert them into their corresponding Euler rates. So let me sort of take you inside this yellow subsystem that, that does that body rate to Euler rate um, conversion. And here it is. And at the very heart of, of, of this particular part of the model um, is a block that contains some MATLAB code. If I double click on that block, here's the MATLAB code that shows the algorithm for converting body rates into the corresponding Euler rates. And this is going to be another one of those learning tasks that we'll look at in more detail in just a moment. The whole point of having a mathematical model is is to solve it, to, to sort of um, uh, stimulate it with, with inputs and observe how this dynamic system evolves. So why don't I do that for you right now? Let's let's solve this model. So I'm, I'm running or solving the Simulink model. Um, on the right hand side of the screen you can kind of see a bird's eye view, the, the, the ground plane view of, of the quadcopter as it's sort of um, flying a mission. 
On the left hand side of the screen you can see a collection of oscilloscope traces. The uh, column of yellow plots shows the inertial XYZ uh, trace and the column of blue plots shows the Euler yaw, pitch and roll angles as the quadcopter flies its mission. Before we take uh, a deeper dive into some of the systems that you've just seen uh, right now, let's rewind and define um, in a little bit more detail what we mean by deeper learning engagements with your students. So let's go back and, and do that now. Okay, so here's today's agenda. First of all, I'm going to review two of the most common learning strategies that we see students applying, surface learning and deep learning. And then I'm going to spend the bulk of the, the remainder of today talking to you about how the MATLAB technical computing environment can support or encourage students to adopt that deeper learning approach. We'll wrap up today by defining some teaching resources that you can download right now from our website. And we'll also answer any questions that you may be typing into your web browser um, during the course of, of today's session. So let's talk about two common learning approaches that we know students apply. The first is something called the surface learning approach. And in this particular mindset, students really um, regard learning as just a means to an end. And that end is all about passing an exam. This really isn't a very productive uh, learning approach. There's a lot of memorization, a lot of rote learning. Students often find it difficult to bring together separate concepts when they try and uh, solve, and, uh, solve problems. And a lot of the time, learning really isn't an enjoyable experience um, when they're wearing this sort of surface learning hat. Now you contrast that learning approach with another style of learning, which is called the deep learning approach. And when a student has the mindset to apply this deep learning approach, they have a genuine desire to want to understand you know, what's going on. They take a lot more ownership in the learning experience. They want to know how to bring together separate concepts and glue them and apply them to problems. And a lot of the time, they find the learning experience a lot more rewarding, a lot more pleasant. So the $64 question, the thing that uh, teaching academics have been working on for the last 20 to 30 years now, is how do you uh, encourage students to transition from that surface learning mindset towards the deep learning mindset? So let's talk about one of the attributes of that deep learning mindset, and it's the attribute of that legitimate desire to understand what's going on. And in the 21st century, teaching academics have one very, very useful tool to try and improve the capacity that, of a student to understand difficult technical concepts. And that's the technical computing environment, something like MATLAB. Now, there are no doubt dozens and dozens of ways that um, MATLAB can enhance this capacity to understand difficult things. I'm just going to talk to you today about four of those. So we'll look at how MATLAB facilitates in breaking down one big complex problem into a series of smaller problems. We'll look at the choices that students have for solving problems. We'll look at the concept of continuity, which is this idea that MATLAB follows students through their degree, allowing them to sort of continually build upon their skills and experiences. And finally, we'll talk about MATLAB's self-serve help system, this mechanism that supports discoverability while also encouraging the student to sort of take that ownership of the learning experience. So if we use the quadcopter case study, let's look at some of the concrete examples on how this MATLAB technical computing environment really can enhance a student's capacity to understand. We're going to look at three sub-problems associated with this quadcopter modelling task, and they are modelling the vehicle, calibrating the electric motors, and designing the control systems. And in each of these sub-problems, we're going to look at a collection of learning tasks. And these learning tasks cover concepts introduced in years 1, 2, 3 and 4 of a typical science or engineering degree. While we're exploring these learning tasks, I want you to keep your eye open for a couple of things. Sometimes we'll be looking at code. Sometimes we'll be looking at block diagrams. And sometimes we'll be using apps. And these are choices on how we discuss uh, the, these concepts and, and review these learning tasks. 
I also want you to keep an eye out for the built-in help system and how this acts as an ever-present companion uh, for you and your students. So let's have a look at how this MATLAB technical computing environment really can enhance your students understanding. Okay, back to MATLAB. So the very first learning task that I'd like to talk to you about is the task associated with converting those vehicle body rates into uh, Euler angular rates. And the mechanism that we're going to use to have that conversation is actually uh, a new feature of MATLAB called the live script or the live editor. So for those of you that are already using MATLAB, um, look, you're most likely using the classic editor to create classic scripts. And that is still an option. But in addition to that classic authoring mode, you now have this, this uh, alternative called the live editor to produce live scripts. So what you're looking at on the screen right now is an example of what a live script in MATLAB looks like. And it's not immediately obvious that this is a piece of executable MATLAB. And the reason for that is there is a lot more emphasis now on you being able to describe uh, a more richly formatted background story. So uh, being able to format section headings, bullet point lists, being able to insert into your script meaningful and relevant images that accompany the background story you, you want to sort of um, give to your students. And as we sort of scroll through the script, we eventually come across regions in the script that contain executable chunks of MATLAB code. So let me sort of run uh, th those, those executable chunks for you now. And every time you, you execute one of those embedded pieces of MATLAB code, if there is any echoing of results um, or creation of figures, those outputs get captured in the output panel, uh, which is this second component uh, on the right hand side here. So look, let me just sort of um, you know, run a few more of these uh, sections. Right. So here we've, we've executed a, a section within the script that echoes the, the three passive rotation matrices associated with your pitch and roll. And if, if you're paying attention, you'll see that in addition to just having the, the, the matrices being echoed, we've actually got embedded in, in those echoed outputs mathematical markup. You're seeing that uh, Greek character formatting has been applied to, for the angles phi, theta, and psi. Yeah? So let me just sort of walk through um, some more chunks of this live script. Here we're calculating that, um, that direction cosine matrix by chaining together the three passive rotation matrices. And again, we're echoing it. Scrolling down, um, here's uh, another piece of narration uh, emphasizing that associated with these Euler angles, we have corresponding Euler rates. And the way that we're going to sort of combine those quantities is to convert all three of those Euler rates, your yaw, your pitch, and your roll. Let's define them in terms of the final vehicle body frame using those nice passive rotation matrices. And then let's vectorially add together those three pieces to get our overall um, body rate vector, which is now defined in terms of our Euler quantities, our angles, and our rates. And now that we have that, that overall body rate vector, let's explore it a little further. So by exploring, what I mean is let's rewrite that body rate vector, but in terms of a matrix equation AX equals B, where we're going to partition out um, the Euler, Euler rate components. So let me just run the MATLAB code that, that re-expresses that relationship uh, in terms of this nice linear matrix equation. So here it is. So it's here where you know the students can then go off and say, well, look, if we've now got a linear matrix equation relating body rates to Euler rates, and my, my objective is to you know, compute the inverse of this matrix so that I've got a, a nice, neat expression for what my Euler rates are. Are there any gotchas with computing that matrix inverse? Are there any singularities? Yeah. So the way to do that is, well, to compute the determinant of that matrix. So here it is. So here we're using the function in MATLAB called debt that allows us to, you know, evaluate the determinant of a matrix. So this is a good segue into, well, how do we know? How do we know that debt was the function in MATLAB for computing the determinant? All right. So let me introduce you next to the built-in help browser. So within the MATLAB desktop, there's a whole bunch of places where you'll see this sort of circular icon with a question mark in it. 
right? So if I sort of click on that icon, it launches MATLAB's built-in help browser. And the user experience is you know, very similar to that of a conventional web browser. You have this um, search mechanism where you can type in nice keywords, determinant of a matrix. Right? Let's search. And the help browser reports back its hits. And as I look through that, hist of, uh, that list of hits, I'm going to jump on this one. And here's an example of you know, the help page, or a help, help page in MATLAB. It's telling you that there is a function called debt. If you present it with a matrix A, it will compute the determinant of that matrix. So this is that companion, that ever-present support mechanism that students can lean on when you know, they, they want to know the, the specifics. I know I need to compute the determinant of a matrix, but you know, what is the exact function in MATLAB? All right. So students will 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 overcome that frustration that that um, that they might experience if they didn't have this rich tool to help draw them towards you know the functions that they need to know about in order to to do these technical tasks. So that's the help browser. So let's just agree that we're not going to fly our quadcopter like an F-35. All right. We're not going to pitch it at plus or minus 90 degrees. So you know with that being said, uh, we now finally can sort of uh, summarize our our result. And that result is we have a nice expression. Here, let me just sort of rearrange these um, these windows. We have a nice expression uh, for the Euler rate vector um, for, for this system. So this Euler rate vector is is expressed in terms of those body rate components, P, Q, and R. And it's also expressed in terms of the Euler angles. Yeah. So what we're going to do now is, um, you know, we we're going to sort of convert this expression that we have for Euler rates into a MATLAB function, and this just means that we can sort of reuse that that algorithm, you know, many many times. I guess your options are you can write it from scratch. You could do that, but you know what? When you encounter these really long and verbose sort of expressions. It's nice to know that there is a, an, an automatic mechanism for you to convert those expressions into MATLAB functions right from the get-go. And the, the, the uh, automatic function creation um, function, it's called MATLAB function. So if I click on it, you can see that we've, we've automatically created a MATLAB function that contains that Euler rate uh, relationship. Not only can we convert expressions into MATLAB functions, but we can also convert expressions into Simulink blocks. So if I sort of execute this chunk, and by the way, the function that creates a Simulink block is called MATLAB function block. When I run it, here it is. And what we've got here is we've got a Simulink block, which when I double click on it, contains the MATLAB code for the algorithm that converts body rates into Euler rates. And you know what? If this looks familiar to you, it should. This was one of the components that we looked at when we were first introduced to that quadcopter model. Right? So this is one of the reusable um, small chunks that we are shoving back into that larger complex quadcopter model. And this is where those chunks um, uh, were, were sort of inserted. Okay, so that's the very first learning task. The second learning task that I'd like to sort of cover is um, a task associated with calculating principal moments of inertia. Now, this isn't always, you know, one of the most stimulating topics uh, to have with, with with your students, but again, using the live editor you can really sort of invigorate and sort of add a little bit more energy and excitement into these into these you know traditionally dry sort of topics so here's another example obviously of a live script all right you can sort of see i'm i'm defining right from the get go some of the relevant mathematics i have some perhaps relevant images to convey what we're trying to sort of end up with and let me just sort of run the script uh, from top to bottom. All right. So if I sort of go to the authoring environment, I can click on Run, and it's going to run the script in its entirety from top to bottom. So as that script is is running, let me sort of scroll down. 
as you saw in the, the very first oil rate example, we're capturing any echoed output into the output panel of the script. Okay? So here, you know, we're asking the student to explore things like eigenvalues and eigenvectors of matrices. And then we're sort of, um, you know, explaining how these eigenvalue problems then connect back to that, that real problem of, well, how do you compute the principal moments of inertia? How do you compute the orientation of, of, of the axes um, that define those, those principal um, moments? Yeah. So the new thing here is, well, as I said earlier, not only can you capture any output being echoed, um, such as the values of your matrices, the values of your variables, you can also capture plots, okay? And when there is a plot of interest, if I just sort of scroll through, you know, if you wanted to sort of explore um, that particular plot, then you can interact with the plot, okay? So I can sort of use some of these um, visualization sort of uh, utilities, just uh, rotating, zooming the plot. If you want to do sort of more of that, you can double click on these plots and launch a standard MATLAB figure window where you've got access, you know, to the full gamut of, of, of data sort of exploration sort of widgets. Yeah. So the other new thing that I, I just sort of wanted to sort of emphasize here is through the live script now, you've got another mechanism for being able to give to the student not just a static lecture note, all right, that they can look at, but it's a lecture note that they can execute. It's, it, it contains executable pieces of MATLAB code. But at the very end of those executable uh, scripts now, you can insert your tutorial or assignment questions, yeah, that the students can then start working on, you know, within the body of the instructional uh, component, you know, the, the, the lecture that explains the concept. So this, this live script really does open up, you know, um, uh, a much richer environment for you for, to be able to interact and, and, and talk to some of these drier topics uh, with your students. Okay, the next learning task that we're going to re review together is on the topic of solving systems of ordinary differential equations. As a starting point, um, let's look at another instance of the live script. So here you can sort of see that we're sort of setting the scene for what it is that we want to talk to the students about. In the context of the quadcopter, we've got uh, nonlinear dynamics described by six degrees of freedom. We have three equations that, that uh, represent the translational dynamics, um, your f equals ma variant. And we have another three equations that represent the moment or torque variant, you know, the um, i alpha equals tau uh, sets of equations. And as we sort of scroll through this instance of a live script, uh, let me just um, uh, run a couple of chunks of code. This first chunk of code that I'm running is just defining into the workspace some you know, inertias and some masses of the quadcopter. The second chunk that I'm going to execute is we're actually going to read an Excel file. And look, I'll talk more about this um, in, when we talk about the calibration uh, learning task. But for the moment, look, we have an Excel file and there's a function in MATLAB called read table that allows me to read the data in that Excel file. Now, the data that I'm reading in here is uh, a collection of force and moment time series um, uh, data. So let me just sort of bring up this plot. So the column of red plots are the X, Y, and Z applied forces uh, in components of the vehicle's body frame that we're going to excite our quadcopter with. The column of blue plots are the corresponding moments or torques, again, in units of the body frame. So this represents the external stimuli that we're going to inject or excite our quadcopter model with. And what we want to do in this learning task is, is have a look at how this dynamic system that is the quadcopter responds when we stimulate it with this type of input. Yeah. Okay, so that's, that's the excitation. So the next next thing that I want to sort of talk about is well, we need to we need to sort of package our unique problem into a generic form 
that can then be presented uh, to ODE solvers. So that generic form, which is you know one of the most common forms discussed in numerical methods, is a form that looks like this. So on the left hand side we have this thing called the state derivative vector q dot and we want to be able to express that state derivative vector as a function of time and as a function of the state vector itself. So for our problem, the state vector is made up of, of 12 pieces. It has three pieces associated with the vehicle's translational velocity in components of body frame. It has the three components of the vehicle's uh, body rate, angular vector. It has the three Euler angles and it has uh, the three XYZ inertial frame um, values. And the derivatives of those are going to be what we call Q dot. So let's have a look at how we package our quadcopter dynamics into this general Q dot shape. Yeah. So here's a MATLAB function um, that, that sort of does that packaging. And what I want you to pay attention to is uh, the name of this function is six DOF EOMs. It has as an input time. It has as an input the state vector Q. And this particular function also allows us to present mass, inertia, and the vector of forces and moments that we're going to excite our quadcopter with. So the really um, neat stuff is just down here. All right, so let me sort of draw your attention to this. So here's how we define um, our F equals MA equation. And you can see that we've done a little bit of a manipulation such that the, the left-hand side of the equal sign is V dot. And similarly, uh, down here, we've got our moment equation, and we've done a little bit of manipulation to define the left-hand side of omega dot. Yeah. So these are obviously our, our Newton's uh, equations. You'll also see that we have this thing called uh, Euler rate. So recall our state vector uh, includes um, our Euler angle, so we need to be able to compute the derivatives of those. And if I just sort of scroll through this file, um, you'll see something that probably looks familiar to you by now. You've seen it on quite a few occasions. Um, it's the expression for Euler rates. We derived it uh, about 10 minutes ago. Yeah. So we take those things, and you know, I guess the the last little thing that we need to do is, um, you know, we'll use the the overall system direction cosine matrix to convert our translational velocity from body frame coordinates into inertial frame coordinates. And then we finally package all of those individual things um, into our overall system Q dot variable. Yeah. Okay, so that's part one, right? The next part is um, we now need to talk about how to solve numerically this system of ordinary differential equations. And you know what? We need to be able to have this conversation with two different types of audiences. The first audience is going to be, say, that second year student audience where they're just encountering numerical methods for the first time. And for that audience, we want them to roll up their sleeves and kind of, you know, immerse themselves in, in a collection of algorithms, you know, write it themselves. But there's another type of audience, that, that final year student, that postgrad student, you know what, they really don't want to see a, a round wheel being reinvented. Surely MATLAB's got ODE solvers, just let me use them. So with those two audiences in mind, let's rewind and let's look at how we can engage with those two different types of audiences. All right, audience type one is that early year student where you really want them to sort of, you know, to, to live and taste um, the, the numeric algorithm. And as an example of one of these ODE uh, algorithms, um, the classic runge cutter fourth order algorithm. You know, this is typically you know one of those those universal algorithms that everyone um, gets gets taught and usually asked to implement. So let's have a look at what that implementation looks like using MATLAB. That's the runge cutter fourth order algorithm in pseudocode. What does it look like in MATLAB? So here's a, here's a function that uh, a student, uh, that second year student, uh, could potentially write. And the very heart of this function is, well, here's, here's what the guts of that runge cutter fourth order algorithm looks like in MATLAB. 
And the takeaway is, well, the MATLAB implementation looks remarkably similar to the pseudocode of the algorithm that you'll find in you know, most textbooks. And that's the beauty, isn't it, of using MATLAB as that, that environment for doing technical computing. Okay, so we've just got our second year student to write their own version of the runge cutter algorithm. Let's put together the two pieces. So the two pieces, recall, is we've written our quadcopter dynamics into a function. So this is the function. And we've also written uh, our runge cutter fourth order. And we're going to take our handwritten dynamics and shove them into our handwritten runge cutter fourth order. So let's execute this chunk of MATLAB code. All right, here it is. And you can sort of see some plots have been uh, created in the output panel. So let's have a closer look at those plots. So the red column of graphics show the inertial frame x, y, z coordinates of this quadcopter as it's responding to those force and moment stimuli. And the blue column of plots shows the angular description of the vehicle in terms of its yaw, pitch and roll angle. All right, so we just solved this problem uh, from the perspective of that second year student. Now let's put on a different hat and let's try and engage with that final year student or that postgraduate student. And to do that, we're going to revisit um, the MATLAB help browser. So let me go back and let's relaunch um, the help browser. And I'm going to type into the help browser some keywords, ordinary differential equations. So let's see what we get. Okay, let's have a look at hit number one. Uh, looks interesting. And what we've suddenly uh, found is, you know, here is a whole list of ODE solvers that MATLAB provides you. Um, you know, here's here's one example, ODE45, and here is the description of how to use this built-in ODE solver. Okay, so let's go back to our our uh, live script. And here you can see that rather than using our previous handwritten uh, ODE method, we're going to take advantage of one of MATLAB's inbuilt methods, ODE45. So let's run that. And as we did before, we'll output um, you know, some responses. And they're the inertial x, y, z and the yaw angles. And to the eye, if you sort of um, compare the um, bottom series of plots to the top series, they look very similar. So, on this topic of solving ODEs, there is another alternative, and that is, in addition to using MATLAB, we can use Simulink. Okay? So the system that we're going to be looking at is still very much the classic uh, system of equations um, defined by, by Newton. But rather than implementing those equations in MATLAB, we're going to implement those equations in Simulink. So let's have a look at what that looks like. So I'm just opening the Simulink model of this right now. And here it is. So on the left-hand side of the Simulink model, um, you've got your force and moment stimuli. It's the identical stimuli that we've been um, playing with. And at the very heart of the model um, is this purple block. And inside that purple block are the Simulink blocks that implement those force and moment equations of a six degree of freedom uh, rigid body. All right. So let's get out of the model and let's run this simulation. Let's get this system uh, and solve it. So I'm running the Simulink model now. And let me bring up a couple of scopes to show you some time traces. And here again, we have that red column of inertial x, y, z positions and that blue column of plots showing the yaw, the pitch and the roll. And again, they look very, very similar to the uh, outputs that we, we generated uh, solving this problem using MATLAB. So there you have um, uh, three ways of, of being able to talk to your students about systems of ordinary differential equations. In this next learning task, we're going to look at another alternative for how you can 
engage with your students on these technical topics. In the examples that we've looked at to date, they've revolved around either creating um, scripts, writing lines of MATLAB code, or creating block diagram models using Simulink. So the next pattern is one where the engagement is through apps. So the context here is, imagine that you've done some lab work with these electric motors that are actuating your quadcopter, and you've been able to measure for ver various motor speeds what the produced thrust and torque is. Yeah? And what we want to do in this learning task is to characterize the relationship between those measured motor speeds and the generated uh, torque and thrust. So here's a MATLAB script. It's a live script and it sort of walks through how to solve this problem, you know, by knowing a little bit of MATLAB code. But you know what? We're not going to solve it that way. We're going to solve it through, you know, intuitive uh, GUI app interaction. So let's start. Here's an Excel file. It contains the empirical data that we've measured in the lab. So let me import this data into MATLAB. Um, the most intuitive way of doing that is just to double click on this file. Let's see what happens. When I double click on this file, it launches something called the import wizard. And the import wizard is able to sort of parse this particular file and present you with you know, the data inside. And from here, you can choose how you want that data then pushed across into the MATLAB workspace. And I'm just going to accept the defaults. Let me say yes. So in the MATLAB workspace now, we have four variables that actually corresponded to the four columns of data that were inside that spreadsheet. All right, so one of those variables is the measured angular speed of the motor. And another one of those variables was the measured thrust uh, corresponding uh, to that particular motor speed. So I guess one of the first things you want to do when you've got data is to visualize it, right? And here again, we can sort of take advantage of, of, of the MATLAB uh, environment. If your students don't know what the command for plotting uh, an X data set against a Y data set is, well, they don't need to, all right? They can sort of look at the, um, the plot tool strip, select their data, and, you know, look for some some function, or icon, pardon me, for, for plotting their data. So that tool strip within the MATLAB desktop is also how your students can access the apps, all right? So if I sort of have a look at, um, at all of the apps that are available in my installation of MATLAB, you'll kind of see that there's, there's a category of apps uh, called Math, Statistics and Optimization. And it's inside this math category that you'll see an app called Curve Fitting. So I, I want to show you that now. So this is the Curve Fitting app. Um, how do you drive it? Well, put yourself in the shoes of that student. Uh, X data, Y data. Yep, I think I know what that means. Let's go with thrust for our Y data. And the app is automatically started to, to sort of fit a model through your data. In this case, it's, it's not really uh, the, the, the form of the model is not the form that we want. This is, a, this is a linear fit. But if I look at some options in the app, um, polynomial degree 2, close, close. But again, not exactly. Uh, I don't want to see these additional terms. I just want to see the pure quadratic term. Um, try, try harder, not Fourier, not exponential, custom. Um, that's definitely not the equation that uh, I've been asked to sort of explore. It's more like this equation. Aha, bravo. So here we have it. We've finally converged onto how we can use this curve fitting app to solve this particular problem which is to characterize that speed and thrust data using a pure quadratic. All right. And from here, you know, um, the student can then potentially save uh, this, this session, or he can even export this session as a piece of reusable MATLAB code that he can use over and over again for multiple um, different data sets.
So there is another example of how MATLAB can be used to sort of engage with students and the use of apps is particularly suited for that sort of early year student that perhaps hasn't um, had a lot of MATLAB programming experience. They can still do technical things by interacting with these with these apps. Okay, so there's one more learning activity um, that I'd like to sort of review with you and that's the uh, learning activity associated with the control system design task. So let's have a look at that right now. So in this particular uh, learning activity there are really sort of uh, two main components uh, to it and they are um, the plant linearization piece and that is that we start out with the original non-linear quadcopter vehicle dynamics and we want to sort of linearize that and once we've got that linearized version of the plant we're going to use it to help us uh, design um, roll your pitch con uh, control systems uh, for the vehicle. So what I have on the screen right now is another one of those live scripts and if I was to execute this particular live script it would solve the first primary activity which is the linearization and you know some of the, the key ingredient functions um, that, that this script invokes are functions such as linearize, find op and op a spec. So we could actually run this live script but I think this is probably another really good opportunity uh, to take another look at the apps that are available in this MATLAB technical computing environment. So why don't we try and solve the first part of this control design problem uh, using some apps. So to do that, we're going to start with uh, this test harness model. So at the very heart of this test harness model, we have our original nonlinear dynamic um, quadcopter uh, system. So these are the, those Simulink implementations of Newton's second law equations of motion, nonlinear plant dynamics. And what I've set up at the root level of the model uh, on the left hand side are a series of um, actuation input ports, these green blocks. So we've got blocks that correspond to applied thrust, applied uh, roll, pitch and your torques. They're the system inputs. On the right hand side of that model I have a selection of um, vehicle outputs. And the four outputs that are shown in orange are the outputs associated with altitude rate and the three angular rates of the Euler angles, so roll, pitch and your rates. So this is our, our model, this is our plant vehicle model, let's linearize it. So I'm going straight to the analysis menu, control design, linear analysis. This is going to bring up another one of those, those uh, apps, design apps. So the very first thing in this app is I'm going to sort of configure it so that it recognizes that the green and orange blocks in the model correspond to the overall system inputs and outputs. And then I'm going to get the app to uh, find a, a trim point. So what the trim point does is it allows us to perhaps manually override the initial conditions of the internal states. Right. I'm not going to do that, if you wanted to you could, but I'm going to say look, find a trimming point that is close to this initial condition uh, state of the model. So I'm going to click on find trim, it'll go away and it'll find that, that um, uh, collection of states and inputs to, to, to maintain the vehicle in a steady state pose. So once we've got this trim um, operating point, now we can click on any one of these icons up in the, the upper right hand corner of the app uh, under this linearized category. So let me click on this bow diagram and this is going to go away and it's going to do that um, Taylor series linearization about that trim operating point. Yeah. So the, uh, the output of that linearization piece is the construction of this thing, uh, this uh, state space object. And uh, you could have a sticky beak inside the, the internals of this. Um, here you're sort of viewing the A, B, C, D uh, quartet matrices defining a, a linear state space system. I might just uh, rename it, give it uh, a more meaningful name. Sys underscore six dof underscore lin has a nice sort of ring to it. And what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to have a, a closer look at this. So to do that I'm just going to copy it into the MATLAB workspace. So I'm just going to drag and drop. Yep. So let me get rid of this linearization app, as useful as it was. I think we're done with it. Let's go back to, to MATLAB. 
Okay, so the reason that I copied that state space object into the MATLAB workspace is I just want to sort of have a look at um, at this linearized plant, but from a, a, a transfer function sort of description. All right, so one that I'll, I'll sort of zero in on is the uh, transfer function relationships between the input pitching torque. All right, and here are the various outputs um, associated with with the the model. And the one that I obviously want, want you to look at is the output associated with the pitch rate. So if this is the system output and this is the system input, then this is the transfer function relationship between that input and that output. And as you can see, it's a nice first order thing. And if I sort of scroll down through the list, you can sort of see that um, the other sort of um, uh, transfer function relationships between the system inputs and system outputs were also first order. So as I said, um, we could have got to the same spot that we are right now by running this live script. All right, so um, linearize is the function to, to do that Taylor series linearization. So right now, I think we're around about here. So we're at the point where we've got some defined system inputs, some defined system outputs, and we know the transfer functions between those inputs and outputs. So the next thing that we've got to do is to use that, that linearized plant to design controllers for the altitude control, the yaw, the roll, and the pitch control. Yeah. So the one that we'll do as a concrete example together is we'll design the pitch control system. So the table that I've got on screen at the moment is just a collection of design requirements. So the design requirements for the pitch controller, I'll just sort of circle those in red. You can see that we're, we're being told that we need to design a control system that has a velocity loop step response of quarter of a second and a positional loop step response of half a second. And, and these sort of um, uh, design requirements sort of connect back to the sort of structure of, of the controller. So the control sort of structure that we'll be using is this classic dual loop uh, cascade network. And as you can see, it's got a, an inner velocity loop and an outer positional loop. So once again, let's have a look at how apps can sort of help us uh, design the, the gains um, that are inside these, these two control system loops. So as, as we did before, we'll start out with a, a test harness model that we'll sort of, sort of use to do the control design task. And this is the test harness model that I've used for, for, this, for this overall project. And it contains the controllers for the uh, altitude, the yaw, and the pitch. So the specific design that we'll do is just on the pitch control system. So let's have a look at that one. So here it is. You can see that it has that familiar dual loop sort of structure. So let's um, design each of those loops one at a time. Let's focus on the inner velocity loop to begin with. So I'm just going to double click on this, this green block which contains the, um, the gain. What, we, what I'm going to do now is, is launch um, our PID uh, tuning app. And this is going to help us converge uh, very rapidly on some sensible gains uh, for, this, for this, in this case, proportional controller. App's just coming on screen now and here it is. And let me bring up some of the, the, the control attributes. And the design requirement from memory was uh, a 90% rise time of 0.25 of a second. So if I just interact with the slider bar and just do some pure gain adjustment, we're seeing the immediate uh, impact of that gain adjustment on the step response. And I'm slowly converging towards that 0 0.25, 0 0.252 seconds. That's probably close enough. So the gain uh, for, for that sort of um, design requirement is uh, 0.0507. So let's apply that to the model. Done. And now let's do the identical task, tuning task, but for the outer positional loop. I'm going to launch the, the same uh, PID tuning app. And here it is. Again, we'll just bring up some of the controller attributes, and I think the design requirement for this one was a 90% rise time of about 0.5 of a second. Look, why don't we sort of keep it at that 0.514. Let's update the diagram, and we're done. So having designed this sort of uh, dual loop controllers, um, let's sort of assess the design, um, typical uh, 
uh, input stimuli is a step signal. So let's apply this step signal and see how well the, the design control system actually tracks it. So let's simulate the model. And we just run the sim. If you focus on the bottom plot, the, the, the plot titled position, you're seeing the commanded step, which is the yellow plot, and the overall uh, system response in blue. So the control system uh, seems to be doing you know, a reasonable job. But I guess the real proof of the pudding is to take this um, control design, which was based on the linearized plant, and then to test it out on the original uh, nonlinear plant. So why don't we why don't we do that? So here's another one of those test harness models, and in this case, the plant that we're going to sort of be uh, controlling is that original nonlinear plant. Okay, it's it's this purple rectangle. And what we've got is we've got the the previous control modules that we've designed. Uh, the one that you and I just did uh, a minute ago was this one for the pitch. Yeah. So there's the, um, the inner velocity loop gain 0 0.0507, just for example. I've taken the liberty, of course, of designing the other control modules for the yaw war and, and altitude and so forth. So we've got our, our design control systems, and we're going to sort of specify some input signals that we're going to try and make the controller track. So for the altitude, we've got a step response. Let's see if we can sort of track that altitude command. For the pitch and yaw signals, we've got these rectangular pulses, right? So let's, um, let's run the sim and see how well this control design fares on this nonlinear plant. All right, we just run the sim and you can sort of uh, see from the oscilloscope traces, um, we've got this nice yellow trace for your, it seems to be uh, following that, that rectangular pulse input nicely. Same for the pitch and this um, bottom left hand corner green plot shows the altitude response. Again, it seems to be tracking that, that step input. So the control design seems to be, to be okay. Now I guess you know one of the takeaways from this control design case study, uh, it has to be that tight integration of the control design apps with the plant modeling environment. And I think you know because of this close association, it just brings that clarity to, to the whole control design uh, conversation that you're wanting to have with your students. Okay, so look, I think we've done enough. Um, let me take you back to PowerPoint now and we'll summarize uh, the tasks that we've done. And I'll also uh, talk to you about some free teaching resources that you can download from our website. In the last 50 minutes, we've looked at a collection of typical learning tasks and we've looked at how the MATLAB technical computing environment can facilitate the conversations you want to have with your students. We looked at some specific case studies such as um, how to compute principal moments of inertia, um, how to discuss the relationships between angular body rates of the quadcopter and their associated Euler rates, how to use MATLAB and Simulink to solve systems of ordinary differential equations, how to import uh, empirical data that you've measured from the lab and do things such as regression curve fitting on that data, and the very final sort of case study that we've just finished looking at was um, uh, the control system design case study, and I'm hoping that what you've seen in these learning tasks are some of the examples of how the MATLAB technical computing environment can help you engage with your students. And in particular, how it can sort of enhance that teaching and learning experience in your classroom. The last thing that I'd like to share with you today is where you can find and download free teaching resources for your classes. So on the MathWorks website, we have a dedicated page called MATLAB Coursewares, and here you'll find curriculum packages developed by your peers from around the world that include lecture slides and the accompanying MATLAB and Simulink examples that connect to those lecture slides. And you can download those packages right now and use them in your own teaching classes. Next, if you're looking for ways to sort of shrink the amount of time that you and your tutors are spending on grading MATLAB programming assignments, well, we have this free tool called Cody Coursework, right? And it's an absolute gem, especially for those massive classes that have, you know, 400, 500 plus students. In this Cody Coursework uh, tool, you can define MATLAB programming problems that your students do in their web browsers and then the tool automatically grades and then reports on how your class fared while doing that MATLAB programming task. Cody coursework, check it out. 
The next resource that I think you'll find useful is a free training class and it's called MATLAB OnRamp and you can actually access it straight from the MATLAB desktop. So if you click on this learning MATLAB icon on the desktop it'll take you to this portal page called MATLAB Academy and on that MATLAB Academy page you'll see something called MATLAB OnRamp. When you launch MATLAB OnRamp it's actually a, an interactive training class so it, it, um, it spawns a virtual desktop if you will inside your web browser students get introduced to MATLAB programming concepts and then they get asked to apply those concepts into a virtual command window and they get immediate feedback on, on the correctness of what they've typed in to, to the questions they've been asked to do. So it is, it is an absolute gem, MATLAB on ramp. And the final thing just to, to make sure you're aware of is that if you're doing projects uh, that involve talking to hardware, hardware platforms such as Arduino or Raspberry Pi, um, please check out our hardware support page where you can find and download these free things called target support packages that just make it um, effortless to communicate with these devices directly from MATLAB and Simulink. So that's it folks. Look, thank you very much for, for giving us some of your time today. Um, I hope you stick around though for the next five or ten minutes because we are going to answer some of the questions that you've been um, typing into your Q&A panel uh, in your web browser. Just give us uh, 30 seconds to sort of review them and, and collect some of the more frequent questions that have come through and then we'll be straight back online in just a few seconds uh, to answer those questions. Thank you. Thank you again.